Um, this session is about to start in a few minutes when I'm done talking, actually. Uh, it's about the GDPR enforcement. Um, and it's moderated by Gloria, just here, uh, which I'm going to give the, the mic in a, in a few moments. Just before that, I was asked to communicate with you that um, Privacy Camp um, is presenting three art works in collaboration with Privacy Salon and the Privacy Topia Arts Festival. There is one from uh, Vladan Yola, um, actually two from Yolan uh, Yola, which, is at the, which are at the back of the Salle des Arches, if you want to see them. One is crea he created one with Kate Crawford uh, and is called Anatomy of an AI System. And the other work is a video called New Extractivism. And in the bar, uh, we present the work a Perfect Day by Brussels-based artist Emmanuel van der Oeira. <laughs> Sorry for the names. Uh, it is a documentary turning into a love story on virtual island created to host virtual conferences. Have a look if you're uh, curious and um, don't hesitate to uh, check it out um, by yourself. Uh, enjoy the session and uh, see you around. Thank you very much, and welcome everybody to the panel. This is saving the GDPR through thanks to procedural harmonization. Great, but how to do this exactly? Uh, I'm very happy to see you. I'm Gloria Gonzalez Fuster. Maybe we have never met, but it doesn't matter that much. If we have met before, I'm happy to see you. I hope you are happy to see us all here after two years of online privacy camp. So that's uh, the nice part. And uh, I will be moderating this session, which is indeed about your favorite regulation, everybody's favorite regulation, hello, the GDPR. I'm supposed to moderate the uh, speakers, and I'm supposed to be responsible to be interacting with you to make sure that you feel comfortable and, and, and are engaged by, with this discussion that can be quite technical, I have been told. So please, if it's too technical, if they use strange uh, numbers, that don't mean anything to you, make some noise, let us know, we will explain what is 77 and what is 78. Don't be uh, shy, um, they are ready to, to explain this. I'm also supposed to interact with the people who are not here, uh, who are watching us online. So how am I supposed to do this? People who are not here, if you can see me, you, if you are on Twitter, you can send messages using hashtag privacycamp23. You can say hello, you can say questions, maybe I will see your questions while I look at my phone, not because I'm ignoring the uh, speakers, but to watch the questions. There is another panel at the same time, so please uh, maybe use hashtag privacycamp23 GDPR so your question comes to us and not to the other panel, or, but maybe we can also exchange questions. Uh, Yes, good. So we will start. What is this about? This is about the GDPR, the GDPR almost five years old. It is working, we know it is working, but is it working perfectly or is it working painfully? Um, you can choose your answer and we can discuss how we can make it work better. This is the, the, the subject. To discuss this subject and, and, and specifically this question of procedural harmonization, we have four great speakers. I will briefly introduce them in the order of speaking. First, Elisette Mustert. I think it's the wrong accent because you are actually from Utrecht, but it doesn't matter. And she's a researcher working on DPA cooperation and DPR enforcement. Uh, then we have Romain, no, in speaking order, Wendell uh, Le, Le Grand, who is uh, deputy head of unit, <laughs> deputy head of the EDPB secretariat, following closely all these questions about uh, harmonization of procedures for cooperation of DPAs. Then we have uh, Romain Robert, who is program director at NOIB. NOIB, none of your business, you know, uh, a famous, famous, famous NGO working on digital rights. And finally, we have Maria Magierska, who is also a researcher working uh, in, on the question of the role of DPAs and how DPAs work good, well or not uh, together. So we will all discuss this subject. Uh, I will not in go into the details of the subject because that's the task for Elisette. So you all have eight, ten minutes and I will very, be very strict and then otherwise somebody will be strict with me. Please go ahead. And we will have time for questions, of course. Yeah. Later. Um, yes. Uh, should, no. if, you, if you insist. Yes. Hello. Hello. No? Does it? Just change. 
Okay, thank you for this uh, kind introduction. I will just briefly sketch the situation and how we got to this point where we are actually discussing procedural harmonization uh, for the GDPR. Um, so these discussions take place in the context of cross-border decision-making. So decisions um, where authorities from several uh, member states are supposed to cooperate to receive one outcome um, and that they actually reach consensus on the outcome of, for instance, a complaint or an own initiative investigation. And that takes place in the case where either the data subjects affected are located in several member states or when the data processing takes place in the context of multiple establishments in several member states. Um, and in order to, to come to such an a consensual outcome together, the lead and concerned authorities are uh, required to exchange information, they can assist each other via mutual assistance requests, they can organize joint operations, and very importantly, there is this um, consensus-making procedure laid down in the GDPR where the lead authority has to share its draft decision with the other concerned authorities before it actually adopts a decision. And that allows for a lot of interaction between the DPAs and um, the lead DPA is actually required to take into account um, these objections, uh, if objections exist. Um, so there, there is a consensual outcome, is the ID, um, but um, the difficulty is that it requires a lot of interaction among DPAs, and all these DPAs are um, acting in accordance with their own national procedural rules. And it is, the situation is even more complicated when the European Data Protection Board steps in, because um, well, it, has, it has softer tools to, to step in, and it can support cooperation, for instance, via the support pool of experts, and it provides a platform for interaction among DPAs. Um, but it also has stronger competences. It, it can uh, adopt guidance on how national DPAs shall interact with each other, um, on how procedural procedures should function, on how substantive data pro, uh, GDPR provision should be interpreted. Um, so either um, this influences national decision making, but national decision making can also be influenced by the board via binding decisions. And then you get these very complex composite procedures where um, I want to leave this paper somewhere. Uh, you get this complex composite procedures where input into the final decision comes from either a European body or, and usually end, um, several national authorities. And this creates very complex procedures where this network structure, as we can call it, is um, not always functioning effectively. It can hinder it can hinder enforcement in the sense that it becomes extremely cumbersome and complex and therefore slows down enforcement. Um, but it may also deprive the parties to the procedure of their uh, procedural rights. Um, and therefore, it does certainly not always lead to effective protection of personal rights or broader um, fundamental rights, such as uh, the right to good administration, um, certain defense rights may be violated, um, but, there, but also the duty of sincere cooperation may be, um, may be hindered um, by how this GDPR system is, is designed. And I'm very sure <laughs> that this is not an easy exercise to address, um, and therefore I think it's very important that this panel um, is here and that we can discuss um, what this procedural act shall look like. So we have to think about what kind and what, what type of legal instrument can be adopted, a legal basis for it, but most importantly, its content. And I think um, regarding its content, there are, there are two aspects that are important to address. And this either stems from this duty of sincere cooperation and the right to good administration on the one hand, and on the other hand, this, um, the, these rights of the defense. So to address the first, you see that um, when national authorities are all acting in accordance with their own national procedures, um, this does not only make enforcement very complex and cumbersome, but it may also hinder effective enforcement because national authorities are, for instance, not able to um, request opinions from another data protection authority throughout the procedure because they had to adhere to their national deadlines, which could be very strict. Or the possibility to participate in a joint operation may not be implemented, which 
uh, which does not allow the DPA to actually participate in those, or confidentiality reasons in national procedural laws um, may not allow DPAs to share information, for instance, throughout an ongoing investigation. And then you see that many aspects of the enforcement procedure are only discussed at the end, when this consensual decision-making process formally starts, where it is often too late to actually address certain problems, because sometimes national law, for instance, doesn't allow to reopen an investigation and broaden the scope, because they only had 30 days to do so. And those 30 days will certainly have been passed when you finally reach this consensual consensual decision-making stage. So on the one hand, we have these national um, procedures that hinder cooperation, um, but also uh, do not always ensure that you actually, that, that your procedural rights are protected, so the right to be heard, the access to documents, because sometimes you're not even a party to the procedure. But, and on the other hand, we have problems with um, the details of cooperation obligations that are not, not very clear in the GDPR. So. Um, even when national authorities are able to, um, to actually cooperate and their national procedural laws would allow so, there's a lot of uncertainty um, about how this cooperation procedure shall function. So there are no legal deadlines. It is not um, defined what a draft decision is, what a revised draft decision shall look like, um, how long you actually have to revise your draft decision, um, but also how you should reach consensus on the scope of an investigation early on in the procedure. And that are also all kind of details that can actually be addressed in procedural law, uh, specifically um, applicable to the GDPR. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's a lot to win, in particular, um, with harmonizing these investigation and decision-making processes that are applicable to the national DPAs when they exercise their tasks, but also with regard to these cooperation obligations to, to have them more detailed and more specified. Yes, because I have to make sure that you are following. Are you following everything? Yes. Uh, so now we had a, a very close like zoom in into these many issues that are peer when DPAs have to cooperate in the context of the one-stop shop. And so when does this, all this mess happen? Actually, it happens when there is this cross-border processing of data. Typically, somebody lodges a complaint with a DPA in one member state, but the controller is based, has the main establishment in another uh, member state. And then there's, this situation is triggered automatically in this whole situation where they have to do all this cooperation following those rules that are unclear even to somebody who has been uh, working on this for four years. Uh, all this is, is what we have. And, and what we have now is an acknowledgement of the fact that indeed there are problems. Uh, it's not clear how the DPAs have to cooperate in this one-stop shop mechanism and therefore a sort of agreement that uh, we need a new set of rules that would clarify the procedure. I think that is uh, a fair summary. And then, yes, um, the EDPB is really at the core of this mess. Uh, somehow not, I would blame the EDPB, but a victim and, and certainly not uh, fully only uh, person responsible. But uh, we can uh, listen now to the EDPB. <laughs> So, um, thank you for this introduction. Uh, so, so yeah, I work for the, the DPB. The DPB is the European Data Protection Board. I work for the DPB Secretariat. So, uh, the people providing analytical support, logistical support, administrative support to this board, which is the group of European Data Protection Authorities. So, all the national authorities are part of the DPB. The chair of the DPB is the chair of the Austrian authority, uh, Andrea Jelinek, right now. And, uh, and they work together to make sure that, TDP, that uh, GDPR is applied in a consistent way everywhere, no matter where you are uh, located in Europe. That's our job. We have a regulation. The regulation has to be applied in the same way everywhere. Uh, and the DPB is there to make sure that all the authorities collaborate correctly, work in the same way, and find consensus. What GDPR says is that when there's a case that involves several member states, the authorities have to work together, and they have to find a consensus. Uh, so working together means you need to have common methods, a common understanding of the concept of the law, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is why we at the DPB issue guidelines to explain the, all the articles in GDPR. And uh, authorities are not always in agreement. So sometimes uh, 
uh, they think they should solve a case in a specific way, but uh, the authority that is leading the case does not necessarily agree with the other authorities in the other member states. This is rare, huh? because in most, of, most of the time, there's an agreement, and they find a consensus on the decision, but when it's not the case, there's what we call dispute resolution mechanism, and this is where, where, where the DPB comes in and says, well, this is what uh, the, the lead authority proposed, this is the objections that were filed against this draft decision, and we say who is right and who is wrong, and how the, the final decision has to be amended. So that's our role. We do guidance, and we contribute to the consistent application of uh, GDPR on all the enforcement-related matters. Now, don't forget that GDPR is still a very young legislation. It's been there for less than five years. It uh, became applicable in May 2018. Uh, we had data protection law in the EU since 1995, but uh, there was little uh, cooperation on enforcement, and the stick that the authorities had at the time was much smaller. Uh, I, I used to work before for the French authority, for instance, the maximum fine we could give at the beginning of the 20 years 2010 was 150,000 euros. With GDPR, it's 20 million, or 4 percent of the annual turnover, and it's the biggest figure that counts. So the stick is much bigger, uh, the rules are different, so we need to learn together how to, how to use these powers. Uh, so you understood that with GDPR, the big change for the authorities is not that they work together, it's the fact that there's much more enforcement, much higher stakes, and much, hi much higher powers in terms of enforcement for, for the authorities. So we've been doing a lot at TDPB on enforcement cooperation. Uh, we have a strategy where we said enforcement is one of our, of our top priorities. We had uh, last year a meeting of the commissioners uh, in Vienna, the hometown of the chair of the DPB, where uh, we discussed how to be more efficient on, on cooperation. And we did many initiatives where the authority on a daily basis worked together for better enforcement cooperation. So I'll just list a few very quickly. Uh, there's a report that was published on cloud computing last week, uh, which is the result of the work that 22 authorities conducted at national level. Uh, about the use of cloud services in the public sector. And we identified uh, problems or challenges that the public sector uh, stakeholders may, 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 may face, and we did a number of recommendations for them also. Uh, there's task forces. For instance, there's a report that was also published last, year, last week on cookies, uh, how you have to present the cookie banners, where even though this is a matter that is decided at national level, outside of the a uh, common decision-making process that, that was explained before. It's a different piece of legislation. We still discuss how this has to be applied. We try to find common views, and we explain uh, how we interpret uh, complaints that are filed in the different member states to make sure that, as much as possible, the decisions are going to be consistent. Uh, another example is that was listed before is DSPE, the Support Pool of Experts. Basically, this facilitates exchanges of experts between authorities on enforcement-related matters. So there again, it's exchanging expertise, it's, it's, a, it's a capacity and capability building, if you want. And at the same time, we have a pool of external experts that we can use to help us, to assist us on various assignments that we define related to enforcement. We have more than 400 people on the list that we can we can use depending on their expertise and depending on our needs. Um, other things that we decided to do is to have a common template for complaints, for instance, because in different member states, the, when you file a complaint as a citizen, it's not necessarily exactly the same things or that are going to be asked or not exactly in the same way, and we're trying to harmonize this as much as possible. We're sharing a lot of knowledge also on the decisions that were taken at national level to make sure that when a case pops up in a member state, if this was already discussed somewhere else, uh, we don't reinvent the wheel. And if there's differences, at least these differences are uh, taken in a conscious way, because you know what the others had, what, what other decisions have been taken. So you see, we are 100% committed to this enforcement cooperation, but we can't do everything on our own. And this is why there's been last year a call uh, to the European Commission to do more procedural harmonization because there's differences in national procedural law and we believe 
that if we streamline this a bit more, it's going to be beneficial to enforcement cooperation on top of all the initiatives that we're already conducting. So uh, basically what we did is with four years of experience of GDPR, we went to the national authorities. We tried to understand what problems they had in cross-border cooperation with the other authorities. And we put this together in a document that we called the wish list, which was adopted in October, uh, which we put together also after having consulted with NGOs, because some NGOs were invited to the plenary meeting in, in September and they provided some input. And we have a long letter, which is published on the EDPB website, uh, which was sent to the Commission and included in the 2023 work program of the Commission. So it means that they committed to produce some uh, uh, harmonization to, to deal with at least some of the issues that we, we have identified. I won't give you a long list of all these procedural issues, you can find them in the letter, but uh, they tackle, uh, among others, uh, the, the procedural rights, uh, uh, because they're different or implemented differently uh, depending, on, depending on the member states. Uh, for instance, in some countries, uh, the complainant is not a party to, pr to the procedure, in other countries, it's the case. So uh, it means the way the authority is tackling the case at national level depends uh, on the member state. And if it's not harmonized, this can create objections to the way the procedure was tackled. And then this pops up at, at, at European level when there's disagreement and we have to solve this. So it takes more time and perhaps it's something we can solve by design. Uh, there's deadlines. Uh, sometimes some, dead, some deadlines are not specified in, in GDPR, uh, so we identified them where we think it would be beneficial to have some deadlines. Uh, there's criteria for the admissibility of complaints or the, the, the data you need to provide when you file a complaint is not necessarily the same uh, depending on the member state where, where, you are, where you're based. Uh, the investigative power of the authorities to determine if they're competent. So can I, deal the case, can I deal with the case myself or do I need to send the case to another authority? In order to do this, you need to investigate a little bit and there's a question how much you can do that. The information that you have to exchange with the other authorities to cooperate correctly uh, and other aspects related to cooperation. So this is in detail what we sent to the Commission and they committed to deal with this as much as they can uh, in 2023, so we're very happy that they committed to this uh, because we think this is going to uh, further uh, improve the cooperation uh, within uh, the DPB between the national authorities, uh, uh, cooperation that already exists in practice and is already quite efficient as, as, as you saw based on, on what I explained before. So yeah, based on, it's only four years, we did a lot in four years, there's more and more enforcement cases popping up, big enforcement cases and uh, we're looking forward to continue to improve and be more efficient. That's what we do at EDPB every day. Thank you, thank you very much. So indeed, the, 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 the last part, not the very last part, but the almost last part, uh, this wish list of um, changes or improvements for uh, national uh, pr procedural cooperation, that's, um, I think, the, 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 the specific subject that we, on which we are trying to focus, as you can hear, we know that it's, there are issues that um, it's complicated sometimes, but also data protection authorities know sometimes it is complicated in, in practice because of the procedures. This wish list also refers to practices, practices that will uh, be somehow um, difficult to, to, to reconcile. And uh, the main point, indeed, you, you mentioned, uh, Wendell, that uh, the civil society was involved in this discussion, and indeed that was the case, because this is not just a, an issue for DPAs. Um, that would be very boring, of course, if it was only about DPAs cooperating. Uh, what is at stake, of course, is data protection remedies. It is, uh, can you actually have any faith when you lodge a complaint that there will be a meaningful, uh, time, uh, timely follow-up? And this is why it's also very important to have here uh, the voice of somebody who has uh, experience in, 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 seeing, in trying to make this work and, and keep insisting on this. Um, and with this, I give the floor to Roma. Is it, is it working? Thank you, Goria. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Is it working? Yeah. <coughs> Just losing my voice. <laughs> um, I, I, I decided this morning to walk through a journey, a journey that was the one that we had with the meta decision. I, I, I guess you all heard about, about the meta decision adopted by the EDPB last week and two weeks ago when uh, Noib filed a complaint four years ago um, against meta in three uh, DPAs. And I thought it was a nice example to 
walk you through what we have to <laughs> go through every day to enforce the GDPR. You will see it's not a walk in the park. Um, and I hope that I'm not going to lose you in all the details, but I'm trying to make a story of what we did. So 25th of May 2018, NOB is filing three complaints against Meta, one in Belgium against Instagram, another one in Germany against WhatsApp, another one against um, I'm losing myself, uh, Facebook in Austria. <clears throat> For the same thing, just because um, Meta Group was not using the data on any appropriate legal basis. Basically, they were just using the data for something they were not supposed to use them for. <clears throat> That's the basic complaint. Plus, they were using a lot of other data for other purposes that were not really clear in the GDPR. Just remember that. It's, we can basically divide the complaint into three categories. They used the data for personalized advertising. Second, they were using sensitive data, like or sexual orientation and other sensitive data. And they were using other data, sharing data, uh, cookies, pixel, and everything. These three categories, right? Remember that. That's what we did four years, almost five years ago. That's what we did, like, laughable. Um, we filed three complaints, Belgium, Austria, Germany. Germany and Austria answered to us in German. Wow, you would see it's logical. No, Belgium answered to us in English. As you know, Bel English is an official language in Belgium, right? <laughs> so that's where the problems began. So, oh, sorry. So first, first problem that we were encountering was the use of languages in this jurisdiction. So we go to Germany and Austria, makes sense, it, oh, Germany, German language. Go to Belgium, you would expect Dutch, uh, German, why not, or French? No, it's English. Why not English? Like, the answer from the Belgian authority is like, we, we can see that you use English on your website so you can speak English. Because obviously Facebook cannot speak English, right? Or cannot speak French, because they don't have the means and resources to speak French. So that's the first problem that we encounter in these complaints, the use of languages, which is totally not harmonized. Let me go through the park with you. Second problem that we uh, encountered. It's all these files went to the Irish DPC. You heard about the DPC? Normal, they don't do nothing. But they all went to the DPC, um, the Irish regulator, to, which is the lead authority in this case. Um, we were contacted sometimes directly by the DPC, sometimes through the uh, national regulators, so the German, the Belgian, and the Austrian, to ask things to know. Uh, are you here? Are you happy? Whatever. Do you want to submit submission? Something. Always in English through the DPC, always in English in Belgium, in, in German in Germany, and in German in Austria. Still makes sense to you, not for me. Um, we ask an access to the file. The access to the file was denied in Germany, was denied in Belgium, and we, it was granted in Austria. Why? I don't know. It seemed that some harmonization is needed there as well. Of course, Ireland always refused the access to the file. It's just the beginning of the journey. Let me turn the page. No, we received uh, first, and it's not a joke, the DPC is following what they uh, call a six-step procedure. There is nothing in Irish administrative law which just say there was six-step procedure. It can be 15, it can be three, it's just made up by the DPC itself. So they, they kind of to have a procedure in Ireland to, to have kind of a procedure in Irish law. Nobody heard about that, but they, that's the way they do it. So first thing in July, they started inquiry by an inspector in the DPC. They issued a first, let me, it's, they call it a, a draft inquiry report. We were uh, heard on that, so we had the right to submit our uh, submission. Guess what? We received the report uh, translated, machine translated in Germany and in Austria in German, we received it in English in Belgium, because again, English is obviously an official language in Belgium, which is the first thing that I heard ever. Uh, we um, answered to this uh, inquiry report, notably saying that, guys, there were three categories of requests in our original complaints, and you already addressed one of those. The, the way you process the data for personalized advertising. Where is the sensitive data? Where are the cookie? Where, where are the investigation going? It's too narrow. Can you please, and we ask that to the Austrian, the German, and the Belgium DPA, expand the scope of the investigation. It's not the complaint as we drafted it one year ago. This is too, too narrow. The scope is too narrow. The DPC narrowed the scope of the investigation. Belgium, Austria, uh, sorry, Belgium and Germany say we can't do anything. We're not investigating. Austrian DPA, 
Andrei Aguilinek signed a letter asking formally to the DPC to expand the scope of the investigation, saying that NOIB is right, your scope is too narrow. It was four years ago. You will see when I'm going. DPC is no, it's not the scope, it's not the way I read your complaint, but that's the way I wrote it. So I think I know, no, DPC doesn't want to follow the scope of the investigation. Okay, fine. We reached the point of the inquiry report when we had the uh, opportunity again to submit our submission to the DPC via the German and Austrian authority in German and via the Belgium authority in... Uh, you follow, that's fine. Still makes sense, right? I'm just trying not to, to lose you. Um, so we asked the, the, to broaden the scope of the uh, investigation. It was denied. Uh, nothing in the GDPR said that the lead authority has to investigate and only the lead authority, like the DPC in this case. Austrian, German and Belgian DPA never wanted to broaden the scope of the investigation. And we saw that the, this last report of the inspector of the DPC was still narrowing the scope of our complaint, only focusing on the legal basis to process the data. We now reach the interesting point of the, listen to that carefully, the preliminary draft decision of the DPC, Helen Dixon. So it's not a draft decision, it's a preliminary draft decision. We are reaching the step three of the procedure here, almost there. It was two years and a half ago. So we received a preliminary draft decision uh, of Helen Dixon asking which kind of submission we could say. Honestly, we just say, guys, just read what we already wrote twice because we're not going to go there. We're not going to machine translate at another time. It's 200 pages of submission and nothing changed in your inquiry report. So please refer to what we already submitted before. There is nothing new to add because apparently you don't want to broaden the scape. You don't want to address our arguments. We're not going to go there. Fine, Helen Dixon is saying. I'm going to now issue my draft decision. It's like, cool. We're reaching fourth, uh, the step four of the decision-making process of uh, the Irish uh, law, totally made up again, uh, where we were asked to provide our comments. Uh, no, sorry. When we asked to receive, um, after the draft decision, to receive the reason objection that were raised by the other authorities uh, against the decision. For those who don't know, the, the, who don't know, the um, lead authority, in this case the Irish DPA, has to reach an agreement with all the other DPAs to adopt the decision. Uh, and if one DPA only or at least disagree, they have to go to the EPB to have a binding decision, which, what, uh, which is what happened. The DPC answered, uh, uh, since we were not supposed to have access to the information, um, answered that there was no way for us to have access to the reason objection. We went to the Norwegian DPA. Just as a reminder, the Norwegian DPA is not even a, a DPA when we were active, to ask whether we could receive the reason objection of the Norwegian DPA. Lucky for lucky us, the, the Norwegian law is more open when it comes to access requests, and they provided us with the reason objection of the Norwegian DPA, criticizing quite strongly the draft decision of the DPC. So we had access through another DPA when we never had contact with, through documents that we should have in the first place, in my opinion, have access to in the national procedure. Do you follow me? So we go in another country to have access to documents that we should access in Belgium, Germany, and Austria. That's what happened. We went online, we just went public with this document. There was just a whole fuss on the internet uh, about publication of the document that we received in the course of the procedure. Since the DPC didn't like the fact that we just uh, issued this kind of document and published the document, when we ask another access to the file, the DPC say, guys, you have the fundamental right to be heard, but we consider it's appropriate that in this case you will not have it because you were really behaving very bad lately. You were just publishing this decision. It's like, but we were the right. Yeah, maybe, but it's not cool to do so. So you will not have access to the file. Nice, that's fine. Never saw that like. So Facebook have a full access to the file, and you, since you decided to publish this document on your website, you will, be, uh, you will have this right denied, and you will not be heard, except, and be prepared, if you sign a non-disclosure agreement with me. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope it's funny, because it, I, was, I didn't know whether I had to cry or not. I never saw it in my life. Right? 
Uh, of course, we say, sure, we're going to find, we're going to sign an NDA with you to have access to our file, which is a fundamental right. Basically, we just say, sorry, we don't do that. Okay, you're not going to have access to the file. But Facebook doesn't have to sign an NDA, but they will have access to the file. Because Facebook, they are good guys. Nob is bad guys. We publish the documents on our website. Okay, fine. So since we don't have access to the file, we don't have any submission to do, right? So there is nothing to do. I'm trying to be brief, I guess. That's why, uh, that's why I wanted to have a nice, fun story. Um, the file, we were informed by the DPC and the other DPAs that the file was then sent to the DPB because it was quite obvious that there was a disagreement between the DPAs. Um, and the file, the, the trap if I'm not mistaken, the draft decision reached the EDPB, right? It's what it's called, the EDPB. It's f step five, I guess, or six. We don't know. Like, it's one of the six steps. It reached the EDPB uh, for a final decision by the member of the EDPB. Guess what? The DPC uh, organized the right to be heard to, for Facebook before going to the EDPB. Noib, not really. Not really impacted by our complaint, I guess. Uh, EDPB is adopting a decision. We're quite pleased with some of the results of the decision. The EDPB decided that the right to be heard does not apply to the complainant because we are not affected by the decision of the EDPB. So basically, the EDPB thinks that the complainant is not affected by the decision that um, is going to be taken about our complaint. Interesting as well to hear. EDPB is informing the DPC that the DPC has to change the decision because guess what, the DPC disagree with us. It turns out that uh, other colleagues of the DPC disagree with the DPC, so they have to change the decision. And guess what, the EDPB is asking the DPC to broaden the scope of the investigation. <laughs> what a surprise. We were asking for that for four years. Um, but now, maybe you've heard it, but it's another problem. The DPC now challenged the rights and the powers for the DPB to broaden the scope, so we'll see where we're going. Uh, and I wanted to uh, remind you of the three categories of requests that you had in the beginning, so this personalized advertising, the sensitive data, and the rest. So, so far, personalized advertising is kind of addressed by the DPB in the DPC decision. Sensitive data, DPC say, I don't want to investigate in that. I decided to narrow the scope of the investigation. It's up to me, authority, to read the complaint as I see fit. And the rest of the data, still don't know where it's going. So even the Belgian DPA, the DPC, no one investigated it. So where are we now? We receive from the German, the Austrian, and the Belgian authority the copy of the decision of the DPC, because that's what they have to do under the GDPR. They have to communicate with the complaint and the final decision reached by the lead authority, in this case, the DPC. Funny fact, and it's the last one that I want to share, if you win your case completely, you're just informed by the authority when you file a complaint that you won the case. This is the copy of the decision. Since you don't have to challenge it because you won, right? It makes sense. So you're just informed. If your complaint has been wholly or partially rejected by the authority, then they have to adopt two decisions. The DPC has to adopt one decision, and the authority, when you file a complaint, has to adopt another decision rejecting part of your complaint. And this decision, you can appeal it in front of the court. Guess what? We received from the Belgium, the Austrian, and the German authorities an, info, an email informing us that there was a decision, but they never took a position about whether our complaint was partially rejected or totally accepted. So that's another problem that we had. And last point, of course, guess in which language this decision was addressed to us by the Belgian authority? In English as well. So we now have to appeal a decision from a Belgian authority in English before the Court of Appeal. That, and I, so no solution in my little speech, in my little funny speech, but I, want to, I wanted to walk you through the journey of a complaint which just took us five years who has been addressed at, in 15% of our complaint with a lot of procedural issue that maybe we will solve in 30 minutes today. Uh, but I hope you see how it's a struggle still to enforce the GDPR from the complainant side. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you, you can feel a little bit the, the vertigo of these uh, procedural uh, gaps and problems. 
perhaps to situate this, it can help. There are, I think, two big sets of questions. So there are issues about the cooperation inside the EDPB, inside the one-stop shop, uh, many question marks there, how does this cooperation work? But there are also still fundamental questions about the procedure related to a complaint as such, uh, to which extent is a DPA obliged to uh, investigate everything in your complaint? Can they be a bit selective? Not, can they say, ah, interesting, I handled this by putting it here, but I have a different investigation. There are different interpretations in different member states about these very fundamental uh, questions about what does it mean to have a right to lodge a complaint, uh, to which extent do they have to follow this? So you uh, combine these uh, problems of cooperation with the other problems of fundamental questions, we have a lot of uh, trouble uh, potentially. But Maria will explain this uh, better. Thank yeah, you. thanks so much, Gloria. Um, I'm very happy to be here and discuss this question of GDPR enforcement once again. I think we're having this discussion almost every year. And um, I'll try to gather uh, what uh, the previous speakers said already and maybe try to identify what are the challenges for the future that I see here. And I think I see at least four questions to be asked. And first one is what's going to happen in the text of the GDPR as it is now, how the, GDP, uh, how the DPAs will approach this. Second is what will be the role of the DPB, also concerning the meta case that uh, Roman just described to us. Uh, the third question is something that didn't was, uh, just wasn't mentioned yet, and I still want to put this on the table, is that how will we reconcile the enforcement of GDPR with enforcement of all the upcoming new laws and also interaction with existing regulations that already does exist, and I will speak about it in a minute. And the fourth, qu uh, fourth question is what will happen, what will we take, over, uh, from the, take out from the procedural harmonization and what the European Commission will prepare for us? And I will just now would like to very briefly explain all these four questions and the challenges that I see here. Uh, so first one is this current text of GDPR and what happens next. And uh, I see here three potential issues that are, I think some of them are quite easy to be fixed, others not. And the uh, first thing is what Lisette was also describing, and Romeo and Gwendal, you were all mentioning how the DPAs cooperate with each other. And uh, I think it's on the DPAs now, much as hard it is, and I know that they are very overwhelmed with their work, uh, to uh, take this obligation to cooperate loyally and sincerely seriously. And by that I mean uh, using the mechanisms that are already there in the GDPR, uh, formal and informal and joint operations, all of this, it's already there. And even testing it and acknowledging that some of it will, won't work, some of it uh, will take an effect, just trying these procedures, uh, the urgent procedures and all of that. Uh, because it's already there and uh, for now we were talking, Roma was presenting the big case, the meta case that took so many years but all the other cases, of the, there are tons of cases that were already issues on the one-stop shop mechanism but only some of them end with uh, very strict corrective measures, like m most of them are ending with reprieve demands, the best, so why is that, like are these, uh, are these violations somehow uh, less uh, uh, less strict, like, like uh, that, that these uh, controllers they are just facing reprimands for the evaluation and it's much easier to find a controller that is based in one country than uh, several member states. Uh, so it's something to be done, and it's, it's possible to do this now. But it's connected to another issue of the resources and I hear it every time uh, when we have this discussion that it's a fact, the PAs are under-resourced, understaffed, they don't have much uh, capacity even to do this because they are working on national cases. They are already overwhelmed with the obligations that are staying from national laws and then they have this layer of EU cooperation mechanism and I understand that it's a lot. Uh, so I, I think it's time to face it as a structural problem as, rather than individual problem of the HDPA and maybe instead of introducing yet another provision that DPA needs to be, uh, needs to have sufficient budgets, uh, maybe we can try to think of another solutions, maybe decentralizing or centralizing some, uh, some levels of enforcement, uh, maybe adding some flexibility around appointment of the leading supervisory authority. I think there is some field to play with and think of it how to tackle this issue, uh, but just don't wait for member states to finance the, uh, the DPAs because sometimes we need to acknowledge it won't happen and some of them are using this as an excuse sometimes as a fact. And the third wing is something that we as uh, academics and both NGOs are voicing from the very beginning. We need more transparency and I'm very happy to hear uh, from Gwendal and I, we see that EDPB is becoming more and more open. But still I think there is a lot to be done. 
so we know what happens after filing a complaint, how to file a complaint. We did the study uh, last year about that, uh, how to, so, so we as data subjects, we should know what will happen, which DPAs will have amicable settlements, which DPAs will have, like, what deadlines, even this kind of fact, so it should be accessible, and I'm glad to hear that EDPD, uh, EDPB is working on that. And more on, but like, and just my small request, please update the, uh, the data, uh, database on the website of one-stop shop decisions because I think there's still only 250 decisions that are there. And maybe also clarifying the rules of publication, like why some of them are published, why not, it's, it's still unclear. Uh, so these are these three main issues when it comes to the current text of GDPR. Uh, then we go to the role of the DDPB. So, uh, and the, there's a lot of developments there. First is something like Wendell was mentioning, uh, and it's excellent that the DDPB is also trying to cooperate outside of one-stop shop mechanisms, so the co uh, coordinated enforcement framework, the pool of experts, these are excellent solutions, and I'm also glad to hear the, uh, the soft law and the, the role of guidelines here. Although, I knew, like, uh, Gwendol, you mentioned that you are working to harm on harmonizing the compliance filing, but it's also a fact that EDPB can't uh, introduce the, full, the, the whole procedure via guidelines because it's just a soft law, it's not binding. So, uh, and there is the, the whole discussion in EU law in general about the role of that. And then coming, by coming to the meta cases and this recent decision of the EDPB, I think it's clear from what Romain was saying uh, that's something that we already dis, uh, observed, that uh, this cooperation mechanism, that it should be among equal parts, is in fact about, uh, uh, there is this very privileged uh, entity there, and it's this leading supervisory authority, in, the case, in this case it was Ireland, uh, which has a great influence of how much they will share with other authorities and how much information they will provide, uh, whether they will include uh, the, the other authorities and the parties into investigation, whether they can even limit the scope of the investigations. And uh, as a result, the other concerned supervisory authorities, they don't know what uh, the case was about. And then they have, when, they, when this case finally reaches this point of the draft decision, the, the last stage, they have only one month to decide on the case. That's really not a lot to understand all the facts and the, uh, of the legal and, uh, facts of the case. And it has an effect, especially when the authority limited the, the scope of the investigation. So uh, these are big questions that are going to be asked soon. And I'm very curious about the outcome of the DPC, uh, uh, the, the action against the ADPB decisions, because we need to answer uh, whether uh, could the ADPB demand further investigation from the DPAs, uh, could DPC limit the scope of the investigation? And also, what is the discretion that the DPA have when they are, uh, they are waiting for the, the EDPB decision? So here, actually, what happened, uh, the EDPB, for example, they asked the DPA to raise the, the amount of a fine, and the DPC did this, but still the fine wasn't satisfactory, let's say, for some of the DP, other DPAs. So it's like, what can be done, uh, taken out of the decision? And uh, then another question that I think needs to be addressed is also the procedural rights. It's still develop developing, and I will to just mention here this uh, uh, order that was issued recently against the WhatsApp, uh, the WhatsApp annulment case. Um, so WhatsApp appealed against the EDPB decision, and the Court of Justice said that it's impossible for WhatsApp to, uh, to appeal against such a decision because it's not a party of this uh, case. And I think what this case shows us is the whole problem with this procedure and the composite procedures in the EU in general, because there is no court to review the, the entirety of these procedures. We have the national courts in the, for the national decisions, and then we have the, the European Court of Justice that is uh, responsible for EDPB decisions, but there is no entirety to actually cover all the steps of the procedure in a way that would be satisfactory for the parties. And uh, I think there's a growing literature on that already because it's not only a question of the data protection enforcement. And it's something I think that also we should bear in mind that uh, and it's our lessons that we can learn from other fields of law. Uh, finally, the, fourth, uh, the, the third part is the, something that I mentioned. So we had this first AG opinion so far, cooperation with other uh, sectors. Uh, it's still not mentioned, but I think it will be a growing problem. I, you should, I, I'm finishing, just two, two more points. So it will be a growing problem. There is no framework whatsoever on how the DPAs and, for example, competition authorities should cooperate. And it's clear, especially in this, the way this world operates now and how uh, data are involved in almost all every sector, it will be a growing issue. So the question is now, 
what are we going to do this and how the Commission will design uh, the new procedure. And I'm sure that they will, some issues will be addressed, especially the ones that already NGOs and DPAs are mentioning, so the procedural rights, I hope that the timeline will be unified, the, uh, the scope of the complaint should be clarified, uh, the meaning, the, the position of the parties. I, I hope it will be addressed. And I hope that the Commission, and later when we will be debating this, take lessons from other areas of law. Uh, so how, and it's not only going into, for example, centralized model or decentralized model, it's just taking from all the different models that were there and seeing what works, what has not, and maybe it will work for the GDPR, I hope. Uh, so just to sum up, maybe, uh, still, like, there are a lot of hopes among the Commission proposal coming soon, uh, but I still don't think it will solve the issue because actually the problem here is not only the lack of regulation or all these discrepancies that are here, that the fact that we need to uh, reconcile the laws and so on. It's also the, I think that the, the, the intrinsic perspective of how the DPAs see their work. And I think that there are some cultural disagreements sometimes that they are just simply seeing some of them are more on the, seeing themselves like regulators, or they're like more ombudsman. I think it's quite clear in this, uh, disagreements that they have, that, uh, and it's not that easy to regulate this, because it's obvious that they have different goals, different political agendas, so there is a question of how to reconcile this to, um, and how to provide good uh, conflict handling mechanism. Yeah, so, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you all wish to react to everybody. I don't know if you really wish to react immediately or we can just check if there will be questions because then I'm happy to open the floor for questions. That's the priority number one. And I see one volunteer to just break the ice, please. Uh, can you identify yourself so we know who you are, yeah, please? Okay. I the... do, you, do you need a microphone, maybe? Sorry. Hello. I'm Michal, I work for the European Parliament. Uh, thanks for an excellent presentation, and uh, I think Romania should start to look for a publisher to publish your adventures you know, in, a, in a book form. Um, I, have, um, I have, however, a small complaint to you, Gloria, as, Me? as a moderator. I, I, you have no right to lodge <laughs> complaints with a moderator, <laughs> only with DPAs. Be because the title of this panel is great, but how exactly? And, yes. and so far I heard answers to the questions, but what exactly? So people mentioned deadlines, uh, exchange of information, procedure to reach uh, consensus, but uh, I didn't hear an answer to the question how to uh, basically ensure a procedural harmonization. I think um, Gwendal mentioned com, com, commission committed to produce some kind of procedure. Ma Maria was uh, quite straightforward that there will be a new legislation, so uh, probably you know a bit, or the, the, the panelists know a, a bit more than I know myself. So uh, my question is, how exactly? Uh, and and uh, there are basically, I see two options, just to, just to finish. One is, uh, one is legislation, but then on, what, on which legal basis? So uh, we have here subsidiarity uh, principle, uh, Administrative procedure is a competence of member states. This is not a EU competence. Other option I see are guidelines or some kind, I don't know, of communication, but then it would be non-binding for member states. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm sure Maria literally mentioned new legislation. So, so basically, yeah, that, that's my question, how, how it can be achieved. Good. Uh, so because you complain to me, I, I will uh, just... <laughs> Say that it's nothing, nothing is my fault. It's the fault of the European Commission. Uh, they were supposed to be here, but they couldn't. They wanted to be here, but they couldn't. So we can ask them this question. But indeed, I, I think this is the question. We, are, we think something uh, will be proposed at some point. What exactly? I don't know. I think it is not true that this cannot be harmonized. I mean, the GDPR is supposed to harmonize the procedure. You have the right to lodge a complaint. There must be a procedure actually that follows up this. So I'm not sure it cannot, it's not harmonizable. Uh, uh, the, to the extent that you need this harmonization to make this real, and if it's not harmonized, it's not real, I think it, it, it is actually possible, but I'm, I think the speakers should have Yeah, just, the maybe just explain myself, yeah, maybe it was more of my wish, and yeah, I don't know uh, what Commission is planning to do, uh, but I also believe uh, that we will face this necessity to actually introduce something, at least 
on the legal, like at least legally binding, and uh, if not now, then in a previous year, and also in in the view of this com regulations that are coming up soon. And when it comes to the legal basis, I think it's still feasible to do this to this very narrow scope that relates to GDPR enforcement, at least I think. But um, I wonder what maybe. Oh, yeah, well, I, I think in, in the Commission's agenda, it was actually mentioned at the end of the year that the Commission intends to adopt a legislative act. And what kind of instrument that is going to be, I have no idea, but maybe you know more about that. Uh, I assume that that is going to be a regulation, as I think that either an implementing or delegated act would be, um, it, it would go too far and be too complex to, and technical to, to adopt such a decision. Um, and yeah, regarding the legal basis, I think I I don't think that there are many problems with that. In the sense that data protection is protected in primary EU law in Article 16 of the TEU, and it describes, and I actually wrote it down, that the EU has the competence to lay down the rules to protect data. And I think that doesn't necessarily exclude the possibility to lay down procedural rules instead of only substantive rules. In a sense, it, the GDPR already does so, but it is not super detailed. And then there is, of course, also the more broader uh, legal basis in Article 114 of the TFEU, regulating the internal market. But also, um, Article 298 of the TFEU could probably be considered, where uh, the union has the competence to ensure that there is an efficient um, union administration. And then we have to, of course, speak about what a union administration is. But I think it could be argued that a union administration today um, includes also the national in administrations in this integrated administration that we have. And that there's also the flexibility clause, of course, um, at the end of the, the TFEU, which I think would be difficult because it requires consensus in the council, but or uh, unanimity in the council. But I think there are many possibilities and it, it's very interesting to see what the commission is coming up with. Um, in 2023, I'm not sure whether that will be soon at the beginning of the year or later, but... Any ideas on how exactly this is going to happen? No? Okay, I see another question. Are there more questions that we can take a few questions together? No, only one question. Please identify yourself. Thank you. I still have reluctance about not being allowed to ask an anonymous question at the privacy camp. But, but you can ident identify Walter. yourself in a, in, a, in a just so we know more or less, <laughs> more or less vaguely who you are. But my name is Walter van Holst. Um, my question is, and that's kind of following from this, uh, this discussion, is to what extent may this lead to the GDPR becoming a backdoor to harmonizing administrative law across the European Union? Um, because you will harmonize this uh, procedural um, procedures related to data protection will be then open the door to um, other administrative um, law harmonization. Interesting. Am I? I think that's a very sensitive topic, and of course, this was already initiated by the Parliament, and it was on, the, on their wish list. Um, but I think it's a very interesting point because if you start to harmonise procedures under the GDPR, that will certainly or, or mostly affect countries that have these general administrative law acts, like the Netherlands and Luxembourg. Um, and Austria. Um, so it means that those general administrative law acts will have to be set aside um, in particular areas, which makes it even, well, it makes it likely that it could also happen in other areas, or not likely, but easier. Um, and I, I think, and that was also, I, I forgot to mention with the legal basis, um, interesting to look at case law from the Court of Justice, because I think, especially in this uh, principle of good uh, governance and the rights of the defense, there are many links to be found in case law that actually applies to national administrations when they are acting in the scope of EU law. So you don't even need the charter for that. You can just look to case law and see many links and hooks there which could be form a basis for such a general administrative law at, at, at union level for which the GDPR could maybe be a first step. I'm not sure this is reassuring or not reassuring at all. <laughs> Um, I don't know if there are more questions. In the meantime, I was thinking actually for the, for the legal basis, I think it can be also a question of just access to justice in the sense that now there is such an opaque situation when you lodge a complaint that you never know really 
if that was successfully handled by the, by the DPA or not. You never know when you can go to Article 78 and take them to court. I think eventually Romain might want to take somebody to court, but he's forever waiting for this uh, sort of new reply. I think ma many people are in this situation and you can say, well, if this takes forever, that things are lost in the one-stop shop and then there's a problem of access to, to justice. Or if you never receive a notification that your uh, complaint was effectively rejected, dismissed. Arguably, arguably. Okay, I see another question in the meantime. Hello, my name is Saskia Laper. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, you said something about the General Administrative Law Act in the, in the Netherlands. I think there must be some um, studies about uh, the differences or the, the similarities of uh, general administrative law in the different European countries. And what I hear, what I hear about the, uh, the Irish, uh, uh, it seems that they don't have a very strong uh, uh, general administrative law, so maybe it is what they don't have it at all. Oh, that's strange. Because then, what what is the the, the right of a citizen is in 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 a lot of um, uh, with a lot of uh, um, themes. It is very important to have a general administrative law. So it, it it's very interesting uh, subject. Yeah. If I may, but I, I, of course I want to be provo provocative on purpose, they, they, but it's true, like DPC, in Ireland it's common law, so there is no general administrative law, but it's not the only country where they don't have such a law. But you know why? I don't care, because what we need is like people reading the law. A lot of DP are just denying the fundamental right already existing in the national law. Again, to be concrete, concrete example. We sued the Swedish DPA because they denied us the right to be a party and it's written in their national procedure. We, we sue them in court. We, basically, what, I, I don't want to wait for a procedure, harmonization or thing. Really, I don't have time for this. So, no, really, it's, it's going to take two years. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be like, no, I don't care. We fight and we go to court. It takes a lot of resources. It's tiring, but we go to court. So, Sweden, we won. At the Court of Appeal as well, we are a party in Sweden. We can force them to adopt a decision. We did the same in Austria. They denied us the right. Explicitly written in their, in their administrative code, we go to court, we win. No uh, Austrian DP knows that we are after them and we are just asked for a decision. We're going to do the same in Ireland as well. We do the same in Luxembourg. When you force the Lux DPA to say, we want your administrative law to be applicable. And they say, no, it's not applicable to me. Why? I don't know. I'm not sure, but I don't want it to be applicable. OK, we go to court and we remain. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. So I think there is already an administrative law at the national level existing. And it was also the Charter of Fundamental Right, Article 40, right to good administration. That's already a thing. Access to the file, right to be heard. They are just ignored by the DPAs. They don't want to enforce it. It's, 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 it's easy, it's just it's already there. You don't need another law, and they just don't want to apply it. They just they have cold feet. But they, they give the right to be heard to Facebook. That's not a problem. To the complainant, not sure. Voila, that's what I see. Uh, and it's tiring, really. That's why I'm a little bit upset. But maybe... <laughs> I, I, I will be more nuanced and more balanced. Uh, uh, the, no, there's rules in, in, in national administrative laws, of course, with the uh, authorities are, are trying to implement as best as they can. Uh, and, and this gap analysis in the way that you're mentioning between the different authorities is what we did to come up with the wish list I mentioned before. We said there's differences in the way we process complaints across the member states. It can be due to the right to be heard, which is not the same in, in, in all the member states. It can due, be due to what we request in the, in the, when you file a complaint, things like that. Sometimes it has to be signed, sometimes it doesn't have to be signed. For instance, if you send this to another authority to say, who says, ah, uh, you send me an, a, a complaint in my country, it has to be signed. Well, there, there needs to be an agreement on what the rules are, you know, to make sure that it does not uh, slow down the process to uh, analyze the complaint. So this is exactly the work that we've been doing. So we, we, we listed basically uh, important differences in the procedures that would need to be clearly ironed out in uh, uh, the proposal by the Commission that they committed to, uh, to, to, to prepare. Uh, you need to go to the Commission uh, to ask your question, Mihail. Um, um, uh, 
Uh, and, and, and this is what we hope they can do to facilitate the work when we cooperate. Because if you have the same rules, if you apply the same methodologies, if you apply the same criteria to decide when a complaint is admissible or not, if it's clear uh, or confirmed sometimes, because sometimes we have things in, in guidelines that are soft law and that would need to be confirmed more explicitly uh, to, to be correctly applied. Uh, this is identified in what we call this wish list, which is the letter sent to the Commission. And, and we hope that if we do this, on top of all the initiatives we have to harmonize our working methods, uh, this is going to improve, continue to improve the, 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 the collaboration between national authorities. I just want to nuance what you nuance, but of course that's <laughs> what we do best. Um, First of all, and I understand that cooperation is important between DPAs and procedural organization is important for cooperation. My problem is not cooperation with DPAs, it's my right as a complainant and I'm just afraid that the objective of cooperation between DPAs might be a little bit at the opposite of my right to be heard, for example, because if you want to cooperate efficiently, maybe you don't want to hear all the parties because you want to be efficient. That's a little bit the tension that I might see. Second nuance that I would like to see, it's just, and I understand it's not really easy, but there was a study on, uh, and I'm really happy to share it because we made an access request with the DPB to have access to all the documents of the DPAs answering to the DPB about how is my administrative law working. We have this at NOIP. They usually say something to the DPB, but trust me, and I can just give you cases, they just, just do the opposite in front of the court and the national court. So they, they basically, and I don't want to name them because we're going to drop that next week in a litigation, they say to the DPB, we are subject to EE national law, of administrative law, but they just say the opposite in front of the court. I want to be there when I'm going to drop this document when they say the opposite to the DPB, you know? So really, trust me, I'm not lying that not all of DPAs, of course, some DPA just deny the law to which they are subject, and they already confirm to be subject to this law, even in official document to the DPB. So I, I just, it's tiring just to, voila, that's, I'm exhausted, but. <laughs> just a, 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 a quick reaction on, on the first point. Uh, and is also a, an additional comment on the wish list. The wish list identifies the differences. It does not always identify the best possible solution because of course, if you have differences in your national law, uh, you will claim that probably it's, best, it's the best solution and you need to stick with that. So this is why in a way the wish list, at least on some issues, is, is pushing the problem to, to the commission and asking them to find a solution so we have common rules in the future. Uh, that's the first point I wanted to make. The second one, very briefly, is about uh, the role of EDPB also in harmonization, which is uh, clearly demonstrated, I think, by the example that Romain has been giving, where there was differences uh, between the authorities on important legal concepts in GDPR, like this legal basis for targeted advertising, to, to make a long story short, and EDPB decides on this and creates harmonization through the binding decision. So in the dispute resolution process, there's two important points that you see clearly uh, as complainants. First, uh, the DPB decides on complex legal questions on which authorities have been disagreeing for four years in your case at national level. And we have to solve this in a very limited time frame because this, there's a deadline in the law. And the second thing is the impact also on the corrective measures because in those cases, for instance, the final fine that was adopted by the lead, the lead authority uh, was considerably increased compared to what was present in the draft decision before it was submitted to EDPB. So EDPB asked the Irish regulator to reassess the amount of the fine. But in, in just to respond to that, I think it would also be interesting to see if the Commission is going to look at the role of the EDPB, because I think the EDPB indeed has a very important role to play in um, solving disputes at national level. But there are also, especially when you look to other decision-making bodies at EU level, some peculiar things about the EDPB that might make it less efficient than its potential, um, in the sense that the EDPB is highly reliant upon the DPAs in providing information. So if they don't receive all the information necessary for decision making, the EDPB can request prior to initiating the procedure formally further information from the DPAs. But if it 
discovers throughout its decision-making process that it does not have all the information to decide on a case, it cannot decide. So it will simply have to conclude that um, the, the facts do not um, uh, show enough evidence for, for decision-making. And I think if you look, for instance, to ESMA or the SRB or other um, financial agencies at EU level, they actually have the possibility to request further information to the national authorities. And if these authorities are not able to offer this information, they can directly um, address um, the financial parties, so the, the banks that they are supervising, so that they can actually request further information. And that kind of things also within the SRB system, they, the, the SRB can actually follow up on how its own decision is implemented by national authorities. And that are just details that the EDPB is lacking, that the GDPR did not provide to the EDPB. And of course, it will increase the workload of the EDPB, and it is already struggling, I think, with the heavy um, workload and the short deadlines, but it would certainly be something um, to look at and to find inspiration in other EU decision-making bodies to make it even more efficient and to ensure that it can actually interfere with national decision-making uh, at all times. Thanks very much. Owen Dubsky, um, well, I live in the Netherlands, I'm from Ireland. Um, uh, thinking of the, the Mita cases um, and um, that wish list, do you, is, do you, one of the things I still don't understand is the uh, Article 21.2 has this, you know, we have this uh, um, undeniable right to, to, to have our um, uh, personal data not be uh, processed for direct marketing purposes, but GDPR doesn't say what direct marketing purposes means. Um, and uh, from reading the DPC's um, judgment, whatever, decision, um, they uh, seem quite sort of bitter. There's a sort of a bitterness in that decision, and, and I think the DPC still so, sort of, you know, was, was, was forced to, you know, forced their hand. Um, will you in that wish list, um, will the uh, ADPP um, try to s get some clarity, some a, a, a unified new definition of what uh, for direct marketing purposes means? Just to clarify, the wish list is already published, so their wish so list is already that. exists. What we are not waiting for is a legislative proposal, most probably, that will, might be inspired on this wish list. And, and the, so the wish list is published indeed, and it's on procedures and not on definitions or concepts. So we will take the last question, unless this question is uh, an easy one. Mm. Okay, but, but first, first then, please. Yeah. It, can also go for, for a closing thing. It's mainly directed to the two researchers. A few years ago, we were thinking, or some people were thinking, Article 65, that such a nuclear option is never going to be used because undoubtedly it will go to end up in the court of justice and then the whole system of independence and giving instructions will unravel. So what is your thought now that Article 65 decision is going to the Court of Justice on behalf of DPC and probably also in one of the court cases that Neut will litigate in. But I'm asking Lisette and Maria in first place not to make it too political. Thank you. Well, I'm curious to see what is going to happen there because it clearly illustrates that consensus at national level is a very difficult thing and something that can even be brought to the highest level of review. And um, I, I think this is also important because I think Article 65 is not as strong as we thought it would be in the sense that um, the EDPB cannot always decide, it cannot follow up whether its decisions are implemented correctly, and it also leaves actually a lot of discretion at national level, and I think that is certainly a point of concern also within the system, that the EDPB often addresses um, or formulates its decisions in a rather broad way, in the sense that the first decisions, for instance, required a higher fine, but there was still a lot of discretion in how high that fine would be. And I think the recent development that the EDPB is actually giving clear ranges of fines is, is a very good development. But in that sense, I think Article 65 is not so, so powerful as we felt from the beginning. So it would be very nice to have more clarity on that from the court. 
really have time for the last question. No? It's, it's, okay. It's, because I had a last question because I'm, I'm very sensitive to the people complaining. So uh, actually, if uh, you could express not a wish list, but one wish, I'm here the journey uh, that I'm going to solve the enforcement of the GDPR, you have each one wish for this future instrument that perhaps will see the light at some point uh, between, for next year. What would be the one wish, the thing that you really want this future instrument to tackle and to solve? And we will start in, from Maria. Yes, yeah, so uh, coming back to, to, to your question, uh, I'm also very curious about the outcome and uh, I'm also happy that it happened actually because it just shows that we are learning how to enforce the GDPR and it was just all expected, it's a natural process and it's just exciting to see how it evolves and uh, just to track it and uh, how we also formulate, like, we are in the process of forming the, the EU administrative procedure law and that's a fact, not like, even on this very... Uh, empirical level. So uh, it's just very interesting to me to observe this. And when it comes to my wish, uh, oh God, it's very. <laughs> uh, I just wish it was a regulatory level. I think that's like it, it should be a regulation that should be clear and, and as, as easy as as clear as possible. Uh, I'll be very quick. Article 65 is a decision-making process, so it's a way to solve disagreements, and it's normal that we're using it from time to time. Uh, for the wish list, I will take an easy way out. I will say implement all of it. <laughs> so we should, I think if, if DPA was, uh, were working as fast and efficiently as DDPB is working to reach a final decision, and it's a compliment, I think I would be happy. Because when you see the DPC is taking four years and a half to find a preliminary draft draft decision, and have you seen the DPB decision? 200 pages, it took me three, three days to read it. And I would be happy that, yeah, DPA would just reach a decision as quick as the EBB can do. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, my biggest wish would be implementation of the principle of good governance, I think, in the sense that um, the Charter, Article 41, is not um, applicable to national administration, so it has to come from the court's case law, and that's very difficult to understand as a complainant, especially, I think, um, so it would be great to have that in one harmonized document applicable to all DPAs. The microphone, I think we are doing uh, good in terms of time, so I just have to thank you all. Actually, there is time for the surprise last question. Wow. Well, it's a bit of a downer. Um, if you've read the proposed European Health Data Space Regulation, uh, you will notice that it claims not to derogate whatsoever from the GDPR, but it claims it creates a new regulatory space for the health data exchanges, which is effectively put outside the purview of the DPAs with a mechanism that is more vague than the one of the GDPR. So um, it's kind of a call to, uh, to action at, to at least the DPAs to start thinking about a near future world in which you will have health data exchanges that are more or less outside their normal dispute resolution mechanism. I think that was for Maria. Maria was thinking about the other instruments. So no, so, uh, I as I was mentioning, uh, there will be even more regulations and even th there are already clashes between uh, this already standing laws like GDPR and competition law. And uh, I think we can just meet here in the five years from now and we will be discussing the need to introducing some kind of a framework to how the, all the, how to cover all this data. Uh, related regulations and how to how they should interact with each other and what with the DPAs. It's also the question of the of their independence because they are very they they have very strong in, uh, constitutional protection and other authorities are have not. So it it, it will be a, a very interesting time <laughs> years ahead of us. I think. Uh, um, I just hope that we'll manage to fix the the only I'm one sure, regulation. I'm sure because we have um, many possibilities. So thank you very much for being here and please a big applause for our great speakers. <laughs> Separate them, separate them, no fights on stage. <laughs>